one. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Policy Review Committee for Monday, October 19th, 2020. In accordance with the Board of Education's resolution approved on March 10th, 2020, board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair, in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent, may declare a board, a board meeting or a board committee meeting to, to be held, uh, excuse me, to, to be held remotely in, in its entirety without the, without the physical presence of board members, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting, despite not being physically present, and would allow the public to also remotely attend these portions of the meetings that, that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's Policy Review Committee meeting being held virtually and broadcast live stream and on the BCPS website. In order to officially conduct this meeting, all voting items will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making their second motion, and well as well as when as well as when 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 always when wishing to discuss an uh, an uh, agenda item. As a, additionally, as a, as a courtesy of the committee, I ask to inform that Mrs. Clark, Ms. Halley, if you must leave, by calling the team chat feature so the quorum can can be maintained. Mrs. Clark, please call the roll to determine the presence of a of a quorum. Yes, Mr. Offerman. Um, Mr. Mihumza. Here. Ms. Rowe. Here. Ms. Scott. Present. Mrs. Causey and Mr. Offerman. Present. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Causey, uh, excuse me, state the live video footage of the September 21st, 2020 meeting represents the minutes of the meeting. The minutes deemed approved as, uh, as, as, as recorded. In the interest of staff time, I'm recommending that the agenda be amended to allow discussion of new business items for the committee continues with unfinished business items. Unless there, unless, there, unless there is an objection, the agenda will proceed as modified. Mrs. Lowry, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Good afternoon, members of the Policy Review Committee. I'm here this afternoon with Asada Peterson, Manager, Office of the Employee Attendance and Risk Management, to share our recommendations for the revision to Policy 3151, Student Accident Insurance Program. Ms. Peterson. Thank you, Maria. Um, policy 3151 is the Student Accident Insurance Program, and this policy memorializes the board's commitment to offering student accident insurance to parents and guardians enrolled within Baltimore County Public Schools. We normally see this come up in the context of athletics, where families may choose to purchase this, a policy either to supplement an insurance um, that they already have or if they don't have insurance. There is no cost associated with this for the board. This is completely a voluntary program where families can choose to purchase directly through KMK Insurance, which is offered through MABE. Um, and has done so for many years uh, for BCPS. The policy has not substantively changed, but has been um, updated and revised to reflect um, processes and to really clarify uh, how we um, handle accident reporting and just to clarify what has already been occurring. But there are no subst substantive changes. They're more um, being in align with our current uh, procedures and protocols for policies. Are there any questions regarding the policy? Good afternoon, yeah. board members, and thank you, Mr. Offerman, for starting this off. In order to uh, process this, we'll just go around um, 
to see if there's any discussion. And thank you for that presentation of the policy. So, Mr. Offerman? Uh, I don't have any, I, 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 don't, I don't have uh, anything to add, thank you. Mr. Mahamza? Yeah, could you elaborate? Did you say this was uh, an athletic insurance program? Or just in students in general? Students can purchase it, it is for accidents. Um, their families usually purchase it in the context of athletics where they need to have some form of coverage. Um, however, it's uh, voluntary and it's up to each family uh, whether uh, they actually feel that they need the coverage or not. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Ms. Rowe? Ms. Rowe? I have no comments, thank you. Ms. Scott? I don't have any comments, thank you. And I see we have board member Ms. Joes on the meeting. Ms. Joes, would do you have any uh, comments? No comments, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had a question. Um, how is this information provide it to students and parents so that they know about the uh, option that they have that is very helpful to our families. Thank you for asking. Um, typically this shows up um, in a number of manners. Uh, there's, if we're talking about the athletic department disseminating information um, when it comes to being a part of sports teams and things of that nature, that becomes part of that regular process. Um, also, uh, our community superintendents have their publications in which that goes out as well. Um, so you'll see it in a variety of different um, publications that might come out from the school or the athletic department um, to uh, notify families of this. Thank you. Yeah, Madam Chair, I have another question. And, Mr. Uh, in terms of like uh, uh, publicizing uh, this program, would it be like in violin? Would it be uh, available in multiple languages for for English and language learners? I think that's an excellent question. Um, I'm not sure, and I want to be candid with you about how it's been done um, in in the past. Um, but I would certainly like to look into um, multiple languages. Um, and I know that we have uh, students and families of many languages at BCPS, so I do appreciate your inquiry. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So board members, if there are no corrections or additions to policy 3151, it is moved forward for first reading as presented. The next thank policy you, is policy 4500 substitute teachers and Ms. Lowry and uh, Mr. Hodge, please. Thank you, Ms. Causey. I do have Mr. Hodge with me this evening. He's the director of staffing and he will share our recommendations for revisions to policy 4500. Thank you. And excuse me, uh, Ms. Uh, Lowry, before Mr. Hodge gets uh, started, uh, members of the committee, may Ms. Peterson be excused from the meeting? Uh, yes, that is fine. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank good you. Afternoon. Good afternoon, all. Thank you, Ms. Lowry. Um, today, we are recommending that the policy 4500 substitute teachers be revised to conform with the Division of HR's procedures and comply with the Policy Review Committee's editing conventions. We had an opportunity to look at similar policies adopted by other local education school systems, such as Anne Arundel County, Frederick County, Howard County, and Montgomery County Public Schools. Um, on the policy, there are minimal changes. Um, to the standard section, we are recommending to add an additional standard, changing the current standard B to C, and also in the implementation section, removing what was known as section A and adding a sentence. And in addition, we are adding two additional references for legal. 
Any questions? Board members, we can go right around the dais. Mr. Offerman? None. Mr. Mahamza? I have none. Ms. Rowe? No questions, thank you. Ms. Scott? I don't have any questions, thank you. And uh, Ms. Jones is with us. Ms. Jones? No questions, thank you. Thank you. So if there are no corrections, policy 4500 is moved forward for first reading as presented. Thank you. Members of the committee, may Ms. Lowry and Mr. Hodge be excused from the meeting. Hearing no objections, that will be fine. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is policy 8314, meeting agendas. Uh, so that is a policy that we had discussed at the prior PRC meeting. Uh, there was a lot of discussion and so board members asked um, staff to review the recommendations and questions and then to bring back another draft. So Ms. Howie, did you just wanna go through the um, relevant changes? Actually, 8311 is the one that was discussed initially. There were minimal, actually, I don't believe there were any changes to 8314. 8311 is the uh, the version that you asked that Mr. Um, Mercedes provide input in. So I'm happy to start with, the, with whichever one the committee desires. So we can start with item three, which is policy 8311 okay. meetings. Um, I just flipped two pages at once, so we can start there. Thank you. Surely. So members of the committee, um, 8311 is uh, operationalizing, if you will, the COVID-19 um, resolution that the board passed first in March, on March 10th, 2020. Uh, specifically, what this policy does is it provides to the board and to the board's committees the ability to have both hybrid meetings as well as electronic meetings. So within that ability, there are also special rules that are based on the sample rules for electronic meetings that were published in the 12th edition of Robert's Rules of Order and newly revised. So I'm just gonna take a little bit of time and go through uh, both the policy as well as the appendix um, with the committee's indulgence. So first on page one of the, the policy, uh, first of all, what you have starting at line 12 is the authorization that the board provides in its policy to have electronic meetings. Then starting at verse, I'm sorry, <laughs> the wrong meeting at first, but line 21, uh, you then have um, the schedule of the regular board meetings. Uh, we just changed the language somewhat. In uh, subsection three types of meetings, we are just normalizing what has been the board's practice to allow for procurement items during regular meetings of the board work sessions, as well as um, your business meetings. And finally, the meat of the, the policy starts on page two, line 15. First, the general guidance um, in subsection A, which indicates, and this was, uh, was written with Mr. Brusades' input, that it's certainly the board's uh, preference that you have in-person meetings, but sometimes that just isn't possible. Um, subsection B, uh, that indicates, and this is uh, something that's been expressed by members of the board uh, since you have been meeting virtually, that uh, any electronic means would allow for a video display. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the request that the board members have been getting from the community is that the community wishes to see the board. So any platform that is used by the board would allow for a video display. Subsection C. Uh, again, making sure the Open Meetings Act is 
complying with. And then subsection D is just a general concept um, here that if individuals are not um, present for a face-to-face -face meeting, for an in-person meeting, that they still have the right to participate in the face-to-face -face meeting by electronic means. So establishing that you can have hybrid meetings. And then finally, um, about electronic meetings and their minutes. Uh, lastly, in subsection six, or next in subsection six, rather, you're establishing formally what your parliamentary authority is. You already have established in this policy that Robert Rules of Order newly revised is your parliamentary authority. This just simply states it in a more explicit manner. That takes me to the appendix. I do apologize. I remembered belatedly, mostly because Ms. Uh, Clark reminded me that uh, there was a specific request from Ms. Rowe concerning uh, an amendment, a possible amendment to the appendix. The appendix are you know, in parliamentary parlance your special rules of order. And these would be the special rules of order that you establish for your electronic meetings. So first of all, how do you have an electronic meeting? How are they started? Uh, if there is an emergency, the board automatically can have an electronic meeting. And an emergency can be declared by either the board chair in consultation with the superintendent or the committee chair, if we're talking committee meeting, in consultation with the staff liaison. There are also automatic declarations of emergencies. That has not changed from the last meeting. Public notice of uh, an electronic meeting has to comply with the Open Meetings Act. And then subsection three addresses the hybrid board meeting. Uh, so this is for board, meet board members who are unable to participate uh, in a face-to-face -face meeting, that they still have the ability to participate in an electronic meeting. Subsection E is the section that was added just today. Again, my apologies for not providing it to you sooner. Here, um, what you have is that individuals who are participating remotely, and this was a request from Ms. Rowe, that when they are participating remotely in closed or administrative function sessions, that there be specific um, guidelines established, which include that the individual will do his or her best to be in a place that's free from distraction and potential disruption, and that there be no one else who is able to listen in on the board's, the board's closed session. With respect to subsection four, you have login information that must be provided to uh, board members. This is for all electronic meetings. For uh, subsection five, uh, we're asking that board members identify themselves by name. Uh, as you know, past six months, many people have participated in electronic meetings and see sometimes that there are phone numbers listed instead of a name. This way, uh, it's easier for your board assistant to uh, indicate who is in a meeting, and it's easier for the public to see who is in a meeting. There must be um, a quorum call by roll call. That's subsection six. Subsection seven, as you know, when you're in one room physically, uh, a member can raise his or her hand to be recognized by the chair. That's obviously not as easy to do in a virtual environment. So this is the way an individual can see uh, recognition and interrupt someone for a motion that allows you to interrupt. Uh, voting has to be by audible roll call. And then with respect to uh, technical requirements, and this is a recommendation that's in the sample rules and uh, the 12th edition Roberts, uh, in this particular section, uh, basically the board is indicating that if there is a technical disruption, and an individual is unable to vote or unable to listen, then that does not prevent the assembly, the board, from proceeding. Uh, assignment to the floor, again, when we talk about uh, being recognized, that is what is addressed in subsection 10, a video display, so that the chair of the committee or the board is always displayed by video when he or she is speaking. 
forced disconnections has to do when someone's uh, connection is disrupting the meeting, not necessarily their speech, but what's coming through on the line. Again, something that this board has experienced uh, both in board meetings as well as uh, those of you who have participated in Zoom or um, virtual calls of any other manner. However, if there is a forced disconnection, the individual cannot be prevented from participating in the meeting and the board's assistant must uh, provide to that individual alternate means of participating in the meeting. With that, I'm available to answer questions. Board members will go around the dais and uh, for discussion. Mr. Offerman? None at this moment. Mr. Mahamza? I don't have any at this moment. Ms. Rowe? Yes, I just have one question. Um, so in the section where it talks about interrupting a speaker and the rules of interrupting is to use the chat, uh, my only concern there is that there are some times in our rules of order where the necessity to interrupt, which is allowable in the rules of order, needs to happen before certain other events that happen. And those other events happen very quickly. So um, I'm concerned that a chair might not see a point of order or something like that in the chat in the allowable time for that thing to happen. And so I wanted to know if having this in there changes our parliamentary rules for the purpose of raising a point of order or certain things like that that under Robert's rules have to happen very quickly, like before the question is announced or whatever. So the, the question is whether or not, or the issue is whether or not the technology uh, can catch up with uh, the particular um, motion or a point of order, as you said, an incidental motion. Um, uh, calling for division requires uh, that it be done before um, you move on to the next motion. Uh, it's, it is awkward, yes. Uh, this is, uh, this represents the best thinking of the authors of the revised edition of Roberts. Okay, so does that, the, does, does that mean that if someone needs to raise a point of order, they have to do it in chat and cannot do it verbally if we approve it this way? It means that this is a method for raising a point of order or seeking recognition in order to interrupt. If there is another... I'm sorry, you just muted yourself, Ms. Ali. I muted myself because yes. uh, there was competition. I do apologize. Okay. Uh, the, um, the the committee can certainly, if you wish, to have other what? Excuse me, other methods by which uh, the board or committee members can seek recognition. Um, I can write that into your special rule. So, I mean, for me personally, I prefer it the way that it's written now. However, I don't want the way that it's written to exclude the possibility of a member to do something verbally in a situation where things are moving very quickly. So do you have a, are you asking that to be an amendment written? I don't know, Ms. Posse, did you have input on this? I did. And um, as the committee chair, I don't have the ability to raise my hand. So here we go. Um, I, in hearing your question, Ms. Rowe, um, I would say um, that it is, it's not necessarily that the chair of the committee is 
always looking at the chat in order to expeditiously recognize that someone has put something in the chat. So um, I guess the question is, shall thereafter wait a reasonable time uh, for the chair's instruction? Um, I guess that's, that's the that's the question, what's reasonable? Um, because it may be that the chair of the committee or the chair of the um, board meeting is not looking at the chat at that moment. Well, so, and a point, a point of order that needs to be raised immediately before a question is read or before something else happens, the, those things in Robert's rules allow someone to raise those points of order, to raise those issues and allow them to interrupt the speaker. But you can't interrupt a speaker if you have to wait for the floor to interrupt the speaker, if that makes sense. So if you're putting in chat that you have to wait for the floor to interrupt the speaker, it effectively makes it impossible to interrupt a speaker. And there are areas in Robert's rules that call for a person to be allowed to interrupt the speaker. So Ms. Howie, I, I believe, point. right. So Ms. Howie, um, with the Robert's rules newly revised, most recently revised, um, if you could review the, the the points of order that do not require the chair's recognition for the speaker to speak, um, because maybe it's a matter of specifying those in this appendix. So it, there are certain things called interrupting motions, but the, the member would still need to obtain the floor. Yes. So the initial, um, the initial statement might be point of order, chair, I make a point of order. The, um, you know, half of the people have, do not have, are not in the meeting anymore. And then right. the chair would say, okay, can you explain further? And the chair might then say, staff, can you confirm if these members are still connected to the meeting? Um, so then the, the chair may say, oh, we don't have a quorum anymore and we need to recess until we get the quorum back. But so the, the initial statement could be made with, without the chair recognizing them. Right, correct. The point of order. The point of order can interrupt another speaker, but you would still require the recognition of the chair in order to speak. Okay. So... My input would be putting it in the chat is not sufficient. Okay. What's the committee's pleasure? So I'll make a motion if you like that. Um, oh, I'm. I move that Ms. Howie, Howie itemize the types, types of motions of which allow which interruption of the speaker for this particular, particular appendix, appendix item. item. Is there a second? Can you repeat? Sorry, Ms. Beck was not. I move that Ms. Howie itemize in this appendix item the um, Robert's Rules motions that do not, or that allow the speaker to be interrupted so that that can be done without using chat. So just, and I, just to clarify, the, the section seven already indicates a motion that under the rules, they interrupt the speaker. So already indicates that we're talking about interrupting motions. Right, but okay, so but we're talking about interrupting motions and then mandating that that interruption has to take place in chat. I think that's the problem that I have is that an interrupting motion effectively is not interrupting if it takes place in chat. You could deny the person the ability to interrupt by using chat if the chair doesn't see the chat, which happens frequently. And uh, the... 
sample rules from Roberts indicate that the speaker shall use and it simply indicates the designated feature. That's what's in parens. So it is up to each assembly to determine what that feature is based on the platform that the assembly is using. So if it's the committee's desire that it be chat and um, voice, because the other thing to keep in mind is that sometimes we have assemblies of several hundred and they've been meeting online. Right. Uh, so uh, you may have more unwieldy uh, platforms and more unwieldy assemblies. So it's whatever designated feature the assembly wishes to use. So we're charged with basically creating our own parliamentary rules here for this situation. You're charged with adapting to your to the platform that you are using what best meets the needs. Because if a person can't stand up or wave at Ms. Causey or uh, wave at whoever the committee chair is, they have to be recognized in some way. And for an interrupting motion, as you said, Ms. Rowe, you need to be recognized prior to going on to further business of the assembly. Right. So if not, the, the motion could be lost. So there is um, an urgency, which is why you're allowed to interrupt uh, under the rules. I, so, and I think we have me, some board members. Go ahead. Um, just to process this properly, I'm going to second your motion so that we can continue discussion. Although I think clarifying language um, would be helpful. And I have a suggestion in that regard, but I'll let we, you finish what you were saying. We do have some board members who will also call in if they di get disconnected or participate by phone as well. And in that case, they can't make a chat. I don't want to do anything that limits a member's ability to participate under Robert's rules. And I think that it's a very limited number of interrupting motions that exist. And it's been our habit in the past, even in a regular board meeting that's in person, if someone has an interrupting motion to simply interrupt, which probably makes Ms. Howie cringe a little bit. But that is how we've kind of done it. And I think that given that some members can call in and not have chat, interrupting motions should be done by interrupting. And it's, it's very easy to interrupt to obtain recognition and then continue. Go ahead, Ms. Cosby. I believe Ms. Josie has questions too. I've seen her hand. Oh, thank you for letting me know that. Um, I was just going to say that I think what might be better language is um, a motion to um, so this is on page three, line 19, uh, a member who intends to make a motion or request that under the rules may interrupt a speaker shall use chat feature for so indicating. And the motion is to add the language and or unmute and speak. Ms. Rowe, what do you I think, think that's fine. That? I, I, I think that language works well. So then if you'll Uh, I accept that language. Okay, thank you. And I'm, as a second, I'll accept it. Miss <laughs> um, Howie, did you have questions related to that? Or if you want to think about it, we can um, speak. We can have uh, Miss Joes chime in if it relates to this. Miss Scott just raised her hand as well. Okay. So, Miss Howie, did you want to speak first, or shall I have Miss Joes? Let me just make sure I understand the uh, amendment. The amendment, or the, if amended, the um, sentence would now read, a member who intends to make a motion or request or a request under, or request under the rules that 
may interrupt a speaker, shall use the chat feature and or unmute and speak for so indicating, and shall thereafter wait a reasonable time for the chair's instructions? Is that? Yeah, yeah, I like I, that. Yes, that's good. Yes. Okay, got it. Okay. Um, Ms. Joes, did you have questions or comments related to this motion? Uh, yeah, and I don't know if I can speak in because I'm not on the committee. If Ms. Scott gets preference first, or no, can you I can, say? You had, you had your hand up. You're certainly, no, all board members are welcome to participate in discussion. Um, board members that are not on the committee are just not able to vote. All right, thank you. Ms. Howie, when you use Robert's rules, you have, when you look at it, you can interrupt the speaker when you do a, a Robert's rules point of order. So why couldn't that apply to this if somebody had to do a point of order to simply speak up and say point of order? And um, secondly, um, the policy, if you go down to page four, Mm -hmm. Assignment on the floor um, to seek recognition by the chair. A member shall raise her hand in the chat feature. Is that only for women? Men don't have to raise their hand. Is that correct? No. Am I no, hearing that no. right? No, it was uh, gender inclusive language. So as to the second question, as to the first question, uh, as to whether or not um, an individual can simply raise his or her hand um, in order to seek recognition. Uh, this is, again, it's up to the committee to decide if you want to use another method. Um, this is presented for your discussion. So if there's another method that the committee um, desires, that's fine. Um, as to interrupting, if you wish not to use the chat feature, and I think that uh, Ms. Rowe's point was that using the chat feature uh, if the uh, the chair does not see who's in the chat uh, may be missed and then you're not able to, your point of order could be lost. So it, it's, again, the committee's decision and then ultimately the board's decision. And Ms. Howie, to um, one last tool quick for the first, I guess it's, this is page two. The board member shall obtain the permission of the board or committee chair prior to electing. Is that from Robert's rules? To me, the permission sounds a bit authoritarian uh, since we're all volunteers. Uh, I think I'd be more comfortable with something like notify the board or committee chair. But again, that's up to the committee. And no, ma'am, that was not um, suggested by Roberts. Okay, so I, I just think the la language is a bit authoritarian, but up, that's up to the committee to decide. So thank you. And Ms. Scott? And then I see Ms. Rowe. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I did have a question, and it sounds like Ms. Jost did ask that, as because I did see a lot of her, and so that was concerning because it was not gender inclusive and it looked as though the policy may have been written specifically for female members of the board. So um, I was curious, was this written by staff? Because yes, that was okay. And the gender inclusive term is usually considered to be her. Uh, mm. Although now uh, there is expansion and the there is also acceptance in some quarters of using uh, the plural they. Uh, I'm uncomfortable with that because it is a plural and the rules of grammar have not changed. So rather than placing his, her, uh, which can also be done, uh, I have used her. That was my decision. Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. I was curious about that. Um, but also, considering the late time in which we received this, I just received this about an, uh, approximately an hour ago. And so um, my, uh, I make a motion that we table this um, I feel that we table this policy 8311 um, uh, because it wasn't submitted, I feel, in a timely fashion. And we table it and uh, until board members have time to review it and then um, review it and discuss it again. 
so just a couple of um, points. Uh, first of all, the, the, the change to this um, version of 8311 uh, was simply one section of the appendix. Uh, mm -hmm. And second, if you table, tabling is only, or lay on the table, that is only until the end of a meeting uh, when something has arisen that interrupts. I think you probably, or the purpose that you have would probably uh, be better served by um, a motion to postpone. Okay, then I would make a motion that we postpone because it was received within an hour. And I think that something that's important such as this, considering we also have a resolution already in place that we postpone this um, to give members more time to review. So we so already have a motion on the floor. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rowe. Yes, Ms. Scott, we already have a motion um, on the floor. So yeah, if sure. you want to hold that and then we will um, process this and then. Um, so actually you can process uh, a motion to postpone is superior to a motion to amend. So you can process a motion to postpone and then go to the motion to amend and then to the main motion. Okay, thank you. So um, board members, is there a second to the motion to postpone? Second, Offerman. Okay, thank you. Um, and Ms. Scott, did you have uh, want to additionally speak to your motion? Yes, um, it was received within the past hour, and I don't feel there was enough time to uh, thoroughly review it by members on this committee. And I think that, um, as I've said before, we should at least have a minimum of 24 hours to review something as important as this. And I feel that we need more more time to do so. Uh, other board members that would like to speak to this motion to postpone policy 8311 to the next PRC meeting. Um, Ms. I've, um, I've let me just take some hands off here. Um, yes, Ms. Rowe. So I I agree that probably more time is needed. However. I would like not to postpone. I would like to continue in this meeting with questions and work on this item. I think that if we postpone it and we stop working on it, we lose time in this meeting to work on it and ask questions because postponing moves us to the next agenda item. And I would, I would prefer to use the work session time in this meeting. And I think that we can then once we're finished with this agenda item, simply not move it forward to the full board and keep it in committee, which will meet Ms. Scott's desire to not send it to the full board immediately. Um, but the only reason I would like to not postpone at this particular moment is because then we would have to move on to the next agenda item. And I, I think that we could continue to work on this for a bit more. Thank you. Are there other comments um, related to postponing at this point? Um, Ms. Scott, I see your hand. Is that up from before or did you have something more to add? Uh, I did have my hand up. Again, I, like I said, we I, I don't feel that members are fully prepared to discuss this. Um, we haven't um, I feel I had time to thoroughly review it. So um, I would, again, reinforce my motion to postpone. Thank you. Excuse me, Ms. Howie, could you um, outline when these documents were made available to Policy Review Committee and um, so um, policy 8311 and all the other policies were provided um, to the members of the policy review committee last week. Uh, policy 8311, the appendix uh, version two was just provided as Ms. Scott has said um, approximately an hour ago. And the change in the in version two uh, is that a section that I neglected to add on, uh, based on Ms. Rowe's comments at the last meeting, um, is added, that is at um, page two 
uh, starting at line 28. That was not provided last week with the other policy review committee documents that I believe were provided on Tuesday. That's when we posted them, if I'm not mistaken. Ms. Um, Clark can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, thank you. And um, additionally, these policies, uh, policy 8311 and also policy 8314, uh, were discussed initially at September 21st meeting. And so they were, um, the drafts were made available, the policy analysis and the um, drafts were made available about a week prior to September 21st. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Um, I would support Ms. Rowe's uh, idea that we should, when we're all here and we have staff, to process through any additional questions, comments, or uh, motions. Um, and then if Ms. Scott feels that there's uh, a benefit to postponing, uh, that she could do that at the, at the end. So any other comments before we take a vote on the... This, and we're just voting on the motion to postpone, which will stop discussion right now, and we'll move to the next agenda item. Correct. Thank you. So we will do a roll call vote, please, Ms. Clark. Yes, Mr. Offerman. Yes. Mr. Mahomza. Yes. Ms. Rowe. No. Ms. Scott. Yes. Ms. Causey. No. You have three for in favor, two against. Three in favor of postponing policy 8311 without any additional uh, discussion or conversation. Um, okay, the motion carries. Um, so we will bring this policy back at the next policy review committee meeting. And we will move on to the next agenda item, which is policy 8314. Um, and I mean, I just have to make a comment that I, I, I really don't understand board members wanting to postpone any additional conversation um, about a policy that we've had since a week before, since September 14th. So, Hopefully, with policy 8314, we can have full discussion uh, before we decide how to move forward or not move forward. So, Ms. Howie, policy 8314, please. Surely. And if there are any other comments to policy 8311 that board members wish to send to me um, prior to the next board meeting, um, please feel free to do so. Policy 8314 is before you. Um, at this time, and that policy establishes your agenda items for your regular board meetings. Uh, what we have done uh, in presenting the amendments to you is to indicate that uh, there are certain items uh, that you have been discussing, certain agenda items that have already been discussed uh, as a matter of practice, just want to make sure that is accurately reflected in your policy. So, for example, um, subsection 2B, um, we've added four and five personnel matters and administrative appointments. This is something that the board already does at, it, at, at its regular meetings. There are reports, again, also reflective of your current practice, and board committee updates. Uh, reflective of your current practice, but not reflected in your um, in your policy on agendas. And then um, on page two, just some very minor edits, uh, actually one minor edit, um, to page two, and uh, that those are the recommendations of staff for this policy. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Uh, board members will go around the dais for questions or comments. Um, Mr. Offerman? Uh, not at this time. Mr. Mahamza? Yeah, I, I was wondering, uh, the chair, superintendent, and city member reports, are those just like a tradition or and not 
actual uh, agenda items? Just wondering. And I apologize, Mr. Mahanza, um, that I did not think of adding those as agenda items, um, but that's been uh, the chair's report and superintendent's report. I'm thinking back. Dr. Hairston did superintendent's reports. Dr. Marcioni did superintendent's reports. I'm blanking on Dr. Berger. So, uh, yes, it's it's been at least a 20-year practice to have uh, superintendent's reports. So, mm -hmm. uh, whether and it was not um, uh, in my mind that reports under subsection nine included the superintendents, the board chairs, uh, or um, the student member of the board report. Uh, but if that is where, if that is what the uh, the committee desires, uh, it can certainly be clarified. Does that complete your comments, Mr. Mahamza, or would you like to? They, they completed it. I was, so uh, are you going to clarify or should we propose a motion? I would entertain a motion at this time if you would like to make a motion. Okay, uh, I move that um, Ms. Howie clarifies um, the addition of the senior member of the board's report, the chair's report, and the superintendent's report and the uh, agenda. I'll second that. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Mahamza, would you like to make additional comments and speak to your motion? Yeah. Um, the, the, these reports, especially the uh, Sir member of the board and the superintendent, uh, s allows the public and uh, fellow board members to uh, really uh, hear what they've been doing because they are two of the two members who uh, are in the schools a lot, uh, see are around children a lot. Um, so I think they're really important to our board meetings and allow our board members to understand what's happening around our school system. Thank you. And uh, board members, I see one board member with hand up and that's Ms. Rowe. Yeah, so I just wanted to um, ask Ms. Howie when you work on the language for this motion but that was something I looked at too, is typically in Robert's rules, reports happen before new business. And we have the reports, but it's just not articulated in this policy, even though it's in Robert's rules. But I think that there needs to be some distinction between these reports that are happening at the beginning of the meeting are officer reports. And that's different from the reports in nine that are staff reports, external reports, re reports that are coming from staff or the community or vendors or something of that nature, and which is why those reports are moved down in the agenda versus reports that are supposed to happen at the beginning of the meeting. So I support Mr. Mahamza's motion. I just wanted to make sure that it's clarified as officer reports. Yes, ma'am. So does there need to be a amendment to Mr. Mahomes's motion to incorporate Ms. Rose? I don't think so. Okay. Um, Ms. Scott? Uh, yes, thank you. I wanted to um, bring up or find out as far as 8314. Um, if we could add, I make a motion that we add to that, that every meeting we should have a standing um, agenda setting at the end of each board meeting um, before the announcements. Okay, so there's a, a motion to amend on the floor. No. Is this a motion that amends the current motion to amend? Because you can't amend an amendment. Mm, okay. Um, then I withdraw that. I guess we vote first on Mr. Mahomes and then I would make my motion after that. Any other discussion of Mr. Mahomes's motion? Mr. Mahomes, can I ask you to repeat your motion, please? Yeah. I move uh, 
to direct uh, Ms. Howie to uh, clarify at the addition of uh, the chair, the superintendent, and the student member uh, reports be included in the proposed uh, agenda a policy. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Clark, may we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahumza? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Um, Okay, um, Ms. Rowe, it is your turn for um, speaking to policy 8314. Or actually, Ms. Scott, it, you raised your hand and had a comment. Would you like to continue with that? Oh, certainly, thank you. Um, mine was the motion that I had previously made, um, which I withdrew, but just a, a motion um, that for agenda setting, we do that during the full assembly at the end of each board meeting um, before the announcements. Ms. Scott, can I ask you to clarify because um, it seemed to me from the prior meeting that the uh, agenda item that you're adding is for board members to make suggestions for items they would like to see in a future board meeting? Uh, yes, that is correct. And uh, for clarification, um, I feel that the full assembly um, should be involved in agenda setting and e being able to suggest items, like I said, for five minutes before the announcements um, of items they would like to see at the next coming board meeting. Okay, Ms. Rowe? So... I just want to clarify the meaning of the motion because agenda setting as a term has a definition. Um, so we're just, the motion is to have before announcements, what we did in the last meeting, which was five minutes of we go around the dais and people make suggestions. Is that the only thing we're adding or is the suggestion that we complete agenda setting in every meeting? My suggestion, and again, that brings up a good point, Ms. Rose, you spoke to before. You said uh, policy 8314 prevents the board from doing that and that it um, overrides Robert's rules. And when I was looking through 8314, I didn't see that anything that would prevent the board from doing completing agenda setting during um, open meeting with the full assembly. So what is the motion suggesting that that we, that the superintendent and the board um, leadership, no, like I, I'm not clear as to what the motion is at this point. Is it okay. just that we go around the dice and make suggestions or are we abolishing the agenda setting meeting whereby the agenda is set and we're gonna do that for an hour in open session or limit well, setting of agenda to five minutes, which is a problem because it takes a long time. Um, Ms. Rowe, um, I'm going to ask Ms. Scott to um, restate what her what her goal <laughs> is, and then I'm going to ask Ms. Howie to um, provide language that would be a motion to to achieve Ms. Scott's goal. So, Ms. Scott, if you could restate your yes, thank you. Um, I would like for us to do agenda setting with a full assembly. And um, at the end of each meeting uh, around the dais, and um, Ms. Howie, if you could um, provide language for that, perhaps if I'm not clear in, in what I'm saying, um, or if it is um, a different way it should be stated, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Okay, so let me make sure I am, my language reflects what your request is. Um, and part of this is based on what happened at the last meeting. It sounds as if the request is that um, policy 8314 be amended to um, include a new item 12, and the item 12 would be 
discussion by board members of future agenda items? Are you ask, or are you asking that a new item 12 B setting of future agendas by the full board? So I, I heard something different from what I witnessed at the last board meeting. Oh, you heard, okay. Um, and just for clarification, what did you witness at the last board meeting? So I just wanna make sure I'm saying what you heard. <laughs> so what I witnessed at the last board meeting was board members providing to the full assembly uh, few possible future agenda items. Okay, all right. Um, yes, uh, then we can uh, do that. The <clears throat> setting of future agenda items that we are sharing around the dais with the chair um, in the full assembly at the end of the board meeting um, up before the approved, I guess, sort of announcements. Okay, so there be a new heading uh, following information items and or prior to announcements to permit board members to provide and provide uh, possible future agenda items. Correct. And that can, okay, got it. Thank you. So, Ms. Scott, that is your motion? Yes, and I have a feeling I should probably restate it. <laughs> like, um, would you like Ms. Howie to restate it? Yes, please. <laughs> Okay, so let me make sure I have it, uh, that what I'm saying accurately reflects what um, what you want, Ms. Scott. Um, but the motion is to amend uh, policy draft 8314 to include a new item 12, and that item 12 would be future agenda items as requested by board members. Future agenda items as requested by board members. Yes. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you. Other board members, is there um, comments, questions regarding this motion? Hearing none, can we have a roll call vote? Ms. Yes, Clark? Ma Ms. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Thank you. Uh, that motion carries unanimously, so that amendment will be added to policy 8314. Um, now, Ms. Rowe, it is your turn. So, um, I believe that my initial question about reports being in nine and not um, higher up in the agenda was clarified with Mr. Mahomes' question. Um, so I, I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Sorry. Um, no, I don't have any other questions or comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make a couple comments. Um, so the po the policy also includes um, that board members may submit to the superintendent or the board chair a proposed agenda item for consideration in a future board meeting. And that has been um, processed previously with board members sending emails to the superintendent and the board chair um, and the board executive assistant. So uh, I just wanted to clarify, Ms. Howie, that using email, as long as there is not a quorum of the board or a quorum of a committee in the email trail um, is appropriate and it does not violate the Opens Meetings Act for uh, board members to send proposed agenda items individually to 
the board chair and or the superintendent. So as long as the board member who is requesting agenda items is not engaging in discussion that should be held in open session, it's not violative. Um, for example, I'm interested in seeing X, Y, Z on the next agenda or on a future agenda without inviting discussion back about agenda setting, which in and of itself is a legislative function, then no, it would not be violated. But board members do need to be aware uh, that they should not be, uh, they should not be communicating with the full board uh, in a way that could invite discussion back and forth that is not seen by the public. Thank you. And to that end, when I have uh, a head of um, agenda setting meetings sent emails to the board uh, requesting any input that they might have, um, I blind copy board members so that when they reply, if they hit reply all, they're not including the rest of the board on the trail. So that's just a, a way that I um, use email in order to communicate effectively to all of the board members so they're seeing the same information at the same time, um, but also to um, help everyone avoid any Open Meetings Act violation. Okay, thank you. Um, anything else on policy 8314? Okay, um, board members, may I have a roll call vote on moving forward policy 8314 as revised? Yes, Mr. Offerman. Yes. Mr. Mahomsa. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Ms. Scott. Yes. And Ms. Causey. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Causey. So Yes, I would just like to point out that probably a motion in a second was required for that. I and didn't hear a motion in a second. <laughs> right, in the minutes have to have who made the motion and who made the second. And so we voted, but we voted I'm not sure what motion. will be written in the minutes. Well, Thank the you, minutes, Ms. Rowe. The minutes are actually your video. Uh, so um, it's it can be considered an assumed motion. Um, and obviously it was discussed, so... And obviously it was voted on, even though there was not um, a formal motion by a member. Well, we okay. will just make it official. So board members, may I have a motion to move policy 8314 as revised forward to the full board for first reader? So moved, so moved Offerman. Second row. Thank you. Now, Ms. Clark, may I have a roll call vote? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is item five, board ethics policies. Um, and uh, This item is um, on the agenda to guide staff in revisions uh, committee members wish to see in the board's ethics code. So if there's any specific um, recommended changes you'd like to see or specific policies, um, this time can be used for that. I would just um, let the members know that we had um, in the summer approved adding these policies and that we had set them uh, forward in time so that the ethics review panel would have an opportunity to provide input um, to the board. Um, so before I go around the dais, Ms. Howie, did you have anything to add? The only um, thing I wanted to point out to the uh, committee was that uh, there was a question specifically about gifts uh, and what Ms. Uh, Clark has done is provided to the committee a list of all of the local boards of education in the state, whether or not they're elected or appointed, and what their particular um, gifts provision is in their ethics code policies. We, we did we provided that last month, 
but we've added to um, the uh, your reading pleasure this month and have also provided the sample uh, ethics rules that are in the uh, Code of Maryland regulations. Uh, we are, there are actually two forms, a long form and a short form, and we've adopted for all intents and purposes among our uh, 8360 series, uh, the long form. Thank you, Ms. Howie, for um, that explanation and also for the work of staff in uh, compiling this information. The, the table that's included is um, very helpful um, and it really does um, present the information in, in an organized fashion for uh, committee members to review. So with that, we'll go around the dais. Uh, Mr. Offerman? Nothing at this time. Thank you. And also, this is not the final time for the board to submit questions or um, comments uh, to um, the committee and in order to process moving forward. So that's okay. If you don't have anything now, you're, you're going to have additional opportunities. Mr. Mahamza? Mr. Mahamza? I'm sorry, you cut out, uh, Ms. Kalsi. Could you repeat that again? Yes. So board members are welcome to ask questions or provide suggestions to staff for um, evaluating to adjust the policies. Uh, but if you don't have anything at this point, there will be additional opportunities for you to provide questions, uh, suggestions, or um, amendments to specific policies. Okay. Yeah, I don't have any uh, suggestions right now. Okay, thank you. Ms. Rowe? Yes, I have a question. Um, this is a thing that, that I noticed in our current policy surrounding tickets. And so I noticed that in the draft of the ethics policy, you've included language about um, a gift is a gift, but what complies under campaign finance rules is not a gift. But the fact that our ethics policy specifically says that a board member cannot accept tickets provides a remarkable lack of clarity because, for instance, all the board members now have, who are elected, now have campaign finance entities to get elected. When a campaign of some other type, say, for instance, a county council person or someone else, any other person who has a campaign finance entity, will often transfer from one campaign finance entity to another campaign finance entity tickets to events as donations in kind or transfers between campaign finance entities. And the fact that our ethics policy specifically says that board members cannot accept tickets, which is kind of weird because you could take me out to dinner, but I can't accept a ticket. Like I. That seems like a weird arbitrary thing that I feel like we should discuss what the intent of the tickets thing is. But if we're going to do that, it needs to be clarified whether the campaign finance rule of elected officials comping each other to events through their campaign finance entities constitutes a violation of that ethics policy or whether we want to even have that particular tickets rule or whether we just want those rules to be, or, or those um, items, like, I guess I can't even tell if that's a gift, if it's a violation. I My campaign finance entity hasn't accepted any gifts of any comp tech, it's because I just couldn't figure it out. <laughs> so I so, feel like since we're reviewing this, we need to figure this out. So there hasn't been uh, a recommendation made. That's just it. Well, where uh, what staff is asking for is the board's guidance, the committee's guidance um, and desires 
uh, because it was a specific request of the committee to add um, the ethics code policies to uh, the queue for, uh, for this school year. So uh, there's been no recommendation from staff. Okay, so I guess my question to staff is, could, could that be reviewed in light of the fact that board members now have campaign finance entities, whether or not there's uh, that ticket thing of not being able to accept tickets for anything? I don't understand where exactly that came from. I mean, if board members want to say that, you know, we need to have the rules be clear, and they're not clear. I don't know if another board member had a campaign fundraiser, if if I'm allowed to pay to go to their fundraiser, but they're not allowed to make it so that I don't have to pay. I'm not sure which is the greater conflict of interest. And I think we need to have that conversation because with an elected board, we, we all have campaign finance entities now, and none of us knows what we're supposed to do in this regard. So... We need research, I guess. So with the exception of Baltimore City, which currently is fully um, appointed, every other local board in the state of Maryland is either hybrid or elected. So I'm not uh, sure which specific section you're asking um, be reviewed. The one that says you can't accept tickets. It specifically says tickets. So that would be in the gifts policy. So, Ms. Rowe, if I could it chime says in. It says you well. may accept tickets, ma'am. Where, I'm, where, I'm the, sorry. Well, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at 19A050300. Um, it would be page nine. Um, you would have to report those in your financial disclosures. I'm sorry. Show me where you're, where are you looking at this here? I'm looking at the sample policy that the State Ethics Commission publishes. Okay, but I'm talking about our current policy right now. Our current That's policy 80, right 66. now. 8366, yes, ma'am. Um or 8364, excuse me. Hang on, let me bring up what, okay. There's a whole list of documents here I have to find. If you want to move on to another board member, Ms. Howie, I'll find the exact language that I was okay. referring to. I think that's- So I have, Ms. I have Ms. Scott with her hand raised, but I did want to chime in on this point. Um, Ms. Howie, so these policies have been, um, the ethics policies are several policies. So they've been reviewed at different times. Um, yes. Is it fair to say that they would need to be updated with the latest um, State Ethics Commission suggestions? So the current ethics code policies uh, in the A360 series um, were amended Actually, it was when uh, the board became hybrid to include requirements uh, that were imposed upon candidates for local boards of education. Uh, it, the, the committee should also be aware that even after the board uh, approves any part of your ethics code policy, so any of the 8360 series, that uh, the that particular policy then has to be approved by the State Ethics Commission. So the State Ethics Commission has to bless it before it's actually considered to be um, an active policy of the local board. So it, it, it is possible for the State Ethics Commission to reject um, requests from a local board. Although I don't believe they've done that um, since um, we were subject to the State Ethics Commission um, mandates. Okay, so I guess we'll let Ms. Rowe uh, look up what she was looking up because it doesn't seem clear to me why the gift policy says seems to say one thing in the... Um, I found you just it, read it to us. 
I'm sorry. Would you like, I, I did find it if you're ready. So this is policy 8362 and it's section D. A board member may not accept complimentary tickets to attend events that the board member may know or have reason to know are from or on behalf of political candidates or elected officials. However, our other policies are saying that gifts are not, if, if it's allowable under campaign finance, then it's okay. So what I'm saying is this clause and campaign finance laws are in contradiction with one another. And we need to resolve that contradiction. So it is possible that the ethics code policy um, is more restrictive than campaign finance law. Uh, and again, it would be approved by the State Ethics Commission. But certainly, um, I will make sure that um, I review that carefully. Yeah, because I'm looking at places in our policies where it um, there's language exempting. It, it sort of insinuates that if it's allowable in campaign finance, it's okay. And my question is, either our policies say that everything allowable under campaign finance is okay, or it's okay except. And so right now it says everything allowable under campaign finance is okay. And it also says this other thing. And so I feel like it's not very clear. Okay, well, thank you, Ms. Rowe. And as Ms. Howie has stated, she'll take a look into that. Um, and I would just make the additional suggestion uh, that uh, maybe some of the policies need to be updated to um, include that issues related to campaign uh, financing or uh, campaign elections need to be followed independently. You know, they're separate from our policies, but board members still need to, to follow them. Just to make it clear that the Board of Education policies don't govern what the election board go governs. So, however you would research that and evaluate that. Um, okay, so Ms. Scott has waited very patiently. So Ms. Scott, Yes, thank you for that. Um, I was just going to um, just say, yeah, what the items that Ms. Rowe brought up, I was looking as she was talking and I, I didn't immediately see them either. And so um, as an elected board member, I, I just would like clarification on that as well, because I, I, I wasn't clear because it did seem contradictory. So if I understand correctly, Ms. Howie, you're going to review that and then come back to us with some sort of clarification or um, how is that going to be resolved? So, yes, ma'am, I will be reviewing. But as to um, the global changes uh, that uh, the committee wants, I would still need guidance as to what the committee wants to see in the policies. I do understand that you want clarification about any campaign finance restrictions or uh, anything that's permissible. But beyond that, I don't have a very clear idea of what the committee's desire is in terms of revisions. Okay, so it sounds like Ms. Rowe has looked into this and done some research. So then I would just ask, um, Ms. Rowe, do you have guidance for um, the direction that this committee, I guess, should take in revising that? Well, so my entire motivation for wanting to look at our ethics policies was to make sure that we that all of our language aligns and that all of our language is, is consistent and that we do take into consideration the fact that now that board members are elected, we have these types of things. So there wasn't, in my mind, some big, huge global thing um, so much as this specific alignment of campaigns and elections and making sure that we're clear so that board members understand if the expectation of this board is going to be more strict than campaign finance laws, we need to understand what those more strict measures are. Okay, okay. thank you for that. And uh, I guess I would just, perhaps there's maybe some other boards of education that we can look through, look to um, 
who perhaps maybe have gone through this, who have some guidance. Um, so uh, I have not looked into this issue. So unfortunately, I don't have guidance to offer you, Miss Howie. So perhaps, Miss um, Cause, is that something that we could revisit with guidance for uh, how we would like to see this going forward? Certainly, Miss Scott. <clears throat> um, as we stated earlier, this is just a beginning conversation, and we um, are not going to process these policies until well after um, January. I think, Miss Howie, we were, we were talking February timeframe. Um, it was it was in the uh, in 21, but I don't recall the month that we placed this in. We also wanted input from the ethics review panel, and I have sought input from them, but they, because of the pandemic, they have not met recently. Okay, great. So the the uh, short answer, Ms. Scott, is absolutely there is more time. Um, at any time, board, uh, the committee members are free to email Ms. Howie um, and um, the chair of PRC, me, and vice chair, John Offerman, uh, with any input or questions that you have. Thank you. Sure. So, um, Ms. Howie, I had some um, questions related to policy 8364, and I'm just going to make a couple of points, and then we can... Um, move on because we are a little bit behind in our time frame. Um, so policy 8364 um, is the internal board operations ethics code financial disclosure statement. So I would ask that the policy be updated um, to include the related policy 2380, I believe, document retention that was created by the board uh, in the last year or so. And also that it would be um, updated to include the, um, I'm trying to find the paragraph here, the, so it's page three, paragraph six, retention requirements. It says the panel or the office designated by the board shall retain financial disclosure statements for four years from the date of receipt. Um, I would request that that date be um, extend it to either six or 10 years. Uh, we know that there's um, other school system documents that are retained for 10 years related to finances and so forth. Uh, we, it's also come to my attention that the Office of Legislative Audits, who has the authority to do audits of local education agencies, um, and that their look back is typically six years. So um, that came up recently. So that so that would be one suggestion that I have, or an additional suggestion that I have. Um, and I'm looking through. All right. And so that was revised in 2017. Um, okay. Any other board members? I see two new hands, um, and I don't know who was first in the chat here. Uh, Miss Rowe or Miss Scott. Ms. Scott? I, actually, I believe Ms. Um, I thought Ms. Rowe was before me. I, oh, um, okay. Ms. Rowe? I, I, just, had, I just had one um, other follow-up question, too, with the um, complement. There needs, if we're going to keep this complementary tickets, there needs to be a definition of complementary ticket. So is a complementary ticket attendance to an event for which there are no tickets? Or if you pay for the event yourself in which you purchased a ticket, well, then it's not a complimentary ticket. So we need to clearly define complimentary ticket because one could argue that a donation in kind under campaign finance rules is not a complimentary ticket. So in the process of doing all this, I'm not trying to get away with anything here. I'm just trying to make sure that nobody is penalized for accidentally doing something they shouldn't have done because what you should or shouldn't do isn't clear, is my is my thing. So I think that we need to define complimentary ticket clearly. Okay, Ms. Rowe, I think we've talked quite a bit about that. So we're going to try, in the interest of time, we're going to move on. Um, Ms. Howie's taking extensive notes. So, uh, Ms. Scott. 
Yes, thank you, Ms. Causey. And um, also thank you, Ms. Rowe, for um, your due diligence in looking into that. So I think that, yeah, because those are kind of gray areas where it can cause confusion. So I think that's a good thing. Um, my question is, as far as um, Ms. Causey's document retention, I just wanted to know, you said it's four years, moving that to six to 10 years. I just wanted to know why you would want to increase it from four years to six to 10 years, just some I guess sort of some background information on that reasoning. Certainly, so um, currently the Board of Education is um, having a, the Office of Legislative Audits is finishing up an audit that they've been doing of the um, school system. I, I, it's been a year and a couple months. And <clears throat> one of the, uh, comments relates to that documents um, and are not kept as long as the Office of Legislative Audits would look back to in, in a normal course of, of business. So, so that's the reasoning. Our funding authority in the legislature, they routinely do these audits of local school systems uh, in order to make sure that the uh, taxpayers' dollars are being used efficiently, effectively, um, and in compliance with with law and <clears throat> and policy. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, hearing nothing further on item five, we will move to item six. So um, attached to the documents was the um, board resolution that was passed on March 5th, and that was attached to the agenda documents. Um, and so that was passed uh, May 19th. And um, the short version is it gave the uh, superintendent a waiver for fully implementing policy given um, the circumstances that were changing very frequently. State superintendent waiving certain um, requirements, for instance, year-end assessments, um, attendance policies, things of that nature. So it provided flexibility to the superintendent. So in reviewing... Um, resolutions and policies. Um, I reviewed this and um, had legal counsel review, and it would be appropriate at this time to consider um, rescinding this resolution since the board has been able to um, meet regularly to discuss any recommendations that the superintendent would bring forward. Uh, and since the uh, board has even been able to call special meetings when the superintendent felt that there was something that needed to be uh, considered and approved by the board, as we did on July 21st, uh, with the uh, superintendent recommending a virtual first semester uh, to have that capability all semester long. And the board um, held a special meeting and discussed that and uh, voted to approve the superintendent's rec recommendation. So... Um, I would excuse me, committee members um, review that resolution because I'd like to make a motion to recommend to the full board that we resend this resolution. Is there a second to my motion? Ms. Rode? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'll second it so that we can have discussion on it. Okay. So the, the board in May um, wanted to um, give the superintendent the flexibility to administer the school system um, early on in the COVID pandemic crisis when there were a number of changes being made by um, state authorities, local authorities. Um, as we all know, we were in lockdown. Only essential people could, could leave their homes or people could leave for only essential purposes. Um, 
And so we did this to to give the superintendent flexibility. But things have um, we've we've now been able to organize and be able to address the issues that the superintendent needs, um, and so that the, the, this is no longer necessary. So my motion is to recommend to the full board, similar to recommending policies, we would recommend to the full board to rescind the May 19th resolution. Does that clarify it for you, Ms. Rowe? It does clarify for me, and I have questions now. So, um, Okay, and then Ms. Scott has okay. her hand up. So my question is for Ms. Howie. We have a number of policies in which this sort of blanket allows the superintendent to essentially not seek board approval every time there's a situation. And we're still meeting virtually with students. And so what I want to know is how many policies have we not been able to adequately um, comply with as they're worded for which this resolution covered the superintendent's decisions because students are not meeting in person. Ms. Rowe, I'm not aware of whether there are current policies that have not been implemented to the fullest extent because of the pandemic that have not already been waived to a certain extent as a result of the state superintendent's actions. I think what the board, and I, I, pro I probably should not speak for the board's intent, but my recollection, and certainly please correct me if I, if I err, my recollection is that a concern at the time, which was uh, pretty early in the, uh, in the crisis, was that there were policies that just could not be anticipated at the time uh, by the board that uh, the board wanted to provide flexibility to the superintendent uh, to be able to waive. I'm not aware of a specific policy uh, that has had to be waived that also is not, as I said, covered by what the state superintendent um, has done uh, at her level. Okay, so I think before, I, I'm happy for the full board to re-deliberate this issue, but before I would make a recommendation, I would like to know from the superintendent or his designee if he still feels the need for this resolution or if he and staff feel that this re resolution is obsolete. Um, I would like to know what their answer to that is. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Are you finished, Ms. Rowe? I am, yes. Okay, Ms. Scott? Thank you. So, as I understand it, this this resolution gives the board superintendent the ability to, or, or rather not the ability, but um, if he overrides any current policy in place um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, this gives him the ability to do that. I just wanted to understand that. Is that what we're, what this does? Uh, yes, so the key, the key uh, phrase uh, or one of the key phrases is uh, in the resolved section uh, that in the event the superintendent determines that due to current circumstances, any board policy cannot be fully implemented or that full compliance is not possible or practicable, the board hereby authorizes the superintendent to implement such policy to the fullest extent reasonable and practicable and to waive any policy requirement that cannot be met due to current circumstances on a temporary basis without prior approval by the board as long as such action is consistent with federal and state law and regulations and guidance from the state superintendent. Um, so my so thought is sounds, that... Be, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Um, I just wondered if it sounds subjective. It just sounds like it's up to the superintendent's then own discretion. Is that correct? 
Yes, it states without board, without prior board approval. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other board members? I think with um, Ms. Rowe's question um, that I will uh, withdraw my motion at this time um, because if uh, there's additional information that's needed for deliberation, then there's no point in, in taking a vote at this time. So if I'm going to withdraw my motion. The second withdraws. Okay, thank you. So the next item on the agenda is um, item seven, board procedures. And um, again, what we'll do is just bring this topic up and then we can uh, have additional discussion or take action in the future. Um, the item seven is the uh, board administrative procedures and policies in the 8000 series, unlike other policies that have an implementing superintendent's rule, have no implementing procedures. And I thought that it would be helpful for this committee to discuss whether any of these policies requiring implementing administrative procedures, uh, whether we would include those implementing procedures in policies moving forward, or whether those procedures um, could be better addressed in the board handbook. Can you so, say that again? Sure. So policies in our 8,000 series. So for instance, we've just been talking about policy 8311, 8314. Um, unlike other policies um, that have an implementing superintendent's rule where we state, we direct the superintendent to implement this policy and then he'll develop or she will develop uh, procedures or um, uh, manuals related to implementing that policy. Um, so I just thought it would be helpful for this committee to consider um, as we move forward in our work, um, whether any of these policies that do not have an implementing direction, um, would, be, would it be helpful to think about administrative procedures being laid out a little bit more clearly in the policy or whether um, we should also consider more administrative procedures being clarified in the board handbook. So I would just actually point back as an example, policy 8311, which has uh, not only been, a, been revised, but that there's also an appendix, um, version one and version two that had not previously existed that lays out more specifics. So that was a, just a general point of discussion. And if board members want to make comments about it now, that's fine. And if they don't, we can um, address them, particularly as each policy comes forward for review. So at this time, I'm just going to quickly go around the dais. Mr. Offerman, do you have any questions or comments at this time? None. Mr. Mahamza? I have none. Ms. Rowe? So this exact issue is something that I've seen as the chair of the Office of Internal Audit Committee and that has prompted our committee to start working on charters. And I would just like to say that I don't believe that we definitely need to have the policies, but I think the policies should articulate how the implementation is going to happen and depending on which policy it is, it may or may not need that because there are many things that we do have in our handbook, but the time may come to consider committee charters for all the standing committees because there's a lot that gets articulated in a committee charter that is not articulated in the policy. And I, I don't have a problem with not articulating everything in the policy, but if there's not a rule, where does the nitty gritty get worked out? And so I think we should have further discussions about this. Thank you. Ms. Scott? I don't have any further discussion. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, and I would also point out that there's been different work. Uh, the superintendent especially has been engaged in um, through his um, compass. And one of the pillars with organizational effectiveness is to um, review and improve standard operating procedures throughout the school system. Um, and in that regard, um, the um, board is also looking at that through our board handbook, um, but also with a uh, recently <clears throat> um, work of the Office of Internal Audit is reviewing corrective action plans based on prior audits and reviews. And um, I just want to say that I appreciate that work. Um, So one of the things that's been important to this board um, and to me personally is to improve uh, our effective board governance and accountability and transparency. And we have, uh, as a board, called for evaluation and improvements in those areas, including um, the board being engaged uh, more in the work. Um, and so one of the things that we have done is, as you pointed out, Ms. Rowe, in the um, audit committee in working forward is uh, including in the work plan uh, to facilitate the Office of Internal Audit doing those corrective action plans and to do a monitoring of them um, to give the board an idea of how, how things are going, what things were pointed out, and what improvements have been made, and uh, what additional improvements need to be made. So in that process, we've seen where we need to uh, improve our standard operating procedures, especially relates to transition. Um, when there are um, uh, positions where they've had uh, transition, as we have on the board, we, we had a transition of eight members all at once. Um, and um, so that can make it difficult to process the work um, unless you have those codified, as you said, in your charter those codified operating procedures and how the um, implementation is articulated. Um, okay, so if there's nothing further, we will move to um, the committee general good and welfare because we've already worked on item eight and nine at the beginning of the meeting. So with that, I'm gonna go around and see if there is additional um, comments by the board members. So the floor is open for the committee to discuss issues of concern. And I must emphasize that this is not a time to conduct business as there has not been a notice provided as required by the Opens Meetings Act. So are there any issues of concern? I will uh, call on Mr. Offerman. Uh, I believe Ms. Scott's hand is up at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Scott, if you'd like to go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Offerman can go ahead. My hand was up from the uh, previous question. Uh, okay, uh, sorry, I, go ahead, sir. I, I, I have none at this time, thank you. Mr. Mahamza? I have none at this time. Did you say you have none at this time? Yeah, sorry, I said I have oh. none at this time. Okay, thank you, I just wasn't quite clear. Ms. Rowe? Yes, um, I would like some kind of a review. I don't. I don't necessarily want to drag all this into reviewing all of our policies. However, since I've been on this board, this board has a remarkable level of detachment from special education policy, law, rules, and I understand that that is because IDEA and other laws regulate special education, but I'm concerned that because our policies don't speak to a lot of things because it's in law, that there may be things that this board would like to work on or act on to ensure that our students' needs are met, that it's not necessarily even on our radar that students' needs might not be being met. And the reason for that is because we don't hear those appeals. We don't review policy related to special education. It's like as an issue, it doesn't exist. Like it's just fallen into the abyss. And I would like to know from staff 
what policies in our policies impact special education? And in particular, how students are identified for services that they have a legal right to. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. And I would um, suggest for Ms. Howie that the curriculum committee does um, cover topics related to special education. And so maybe um, Ms. Howie can speak with uh, Dr. McComas, who is the staff liaison for the curriculum committee, um, to see how they cover issues and whether there are any areas for improvement in terms of um, accountability for the board in terms of uh, reports coming to the full board or if there are specific um, if there aren't specific reports coming to the full board um, then those may be topics for future agenda items but also may be um, considered for for a policy so so what I'm asking for is more specific than that I want to okay. know our policies as they sit right now. What impact do they have on special education? In other words, do do our policies rely entirely on simply aligning with state and federal law? Or have we taken any of our own actions in policy? If, in other words, is the only thing we've done in policy aligned with state and federal law, or have we done other things in policy? And if we have done other things in policy that go beyond state and federal law, I'd like to know what those things are. But without fully understanding state and federal law, I'm at a loss to review that on my own. So, okay. Ms. Um, Bro, uh, Mr. Mr. Call. We're in the meeting today, and Mr. Cole's uh, significant amount more about uh, special education, special needs law than do I. Um, if you'd allow me to discuss discuss with Mr. Coles, obviously he heard the discussion uh, this afternoon uh, to discuss with him um, a presentation for a future board future board, future board meeting. I see intersections not only with the curriculum committee, but as well with the equity committee. So I just want to make sure that uh, we're providing to you, first of all, uh, the basis, the foundational issues regarding Section 504, regarding IDEA, so that it's clear what statutes and regulation and, and the process, uh, as you said, Ms. Rowe, that does not intersect with any board sort of decision making in the um, mediation and due process process, uh, as you're familiar with. So unlike your 4205 or 6202 matters, um, these are not issues that legally come before the board. But that does not um, mean that the board can't have a presentation on what idea and what Section 504 require. So if you'd allow uh, yes, us to that, have that, that discussion, um, and then I'll work with Ms. Causey as to how uh, to best bring that before this body, again, with understanding the intersection with the interests and the work of the Curriculum Committee and the Equity Committee. Yes, that, that's, exactly, that's exactly right. I feel like we need to be thoroughly educated on this subject. So, so that's why you, I Ms. wouldn't be doing it. Thank you, Ms. Rowe, for uh, bringing up your concern. And thank you, uh, Ms. Howie, uh, for discussing um, options to do that. And I think that the that the um, committee would benefit from that. And I also want to point out that Mr. Offerman is always included on setting the agenda. And um, certainly any board member can email either one of us independently or or call us with any input that they would have regarding this very important topic. Um, Ms. Scott? Uh, yes, thank you. I wanted to know if it was something that we could review, I guess, as far as the board for, uh, based on our presentation that we received at the last board meeting, um, as far as children who are special needs and have IEPs, um, the policy in regards to suspension or expulsion 
of students with IEP or special needs students and how that's applied system-wide, but I would like to know what our policy is in regards to that. And this is coming from the presentation that was given to us at the last uh, Board of Education meeting, which um, gave some startling information in regards to that. Thank you, Ms. Scott, for bringing that up um, because it was mentioned several times in that presentation about having um, the policies um, reviewed and I was very interested in, in what recommendations would come either from the equity committee to policy review or from specific um, departments in the school system that do the work and then see where maybe adherence to policy or some issue not being addressed in policy is preventing them from doing the best work on behalf of all of our children. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Ms. Howie, what would you suggest um, so I'd suggest, first of all, that there at least be a presentation on um, the requirements of IDEA and 504, because there are requirements in the statutes about how, indeed, uh, students with special needs are to be disciplined. Okay, so that's gonna be on your to-do list. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. So we've gone around the dais and um, the last item is adjournment. Is there any further business? Because there is no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.